All right, well, good morning and happy Easter from Ashland Place United Methodist Church. We are so thankful that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. We have two powerful and very different services um, for Easter today. We have the Ascension Sunrise service, which takes place in a graveyard, uh, representing that Jesus conquered death. And we also have the, our, our blended sanctuary service today as well that will have elements of both contemporary and uh, traditional elements of worship. So thank you again for choosing to worship with us. In our blended service today, you might notice that we have eight Easter eggs hidden, some in the sanctuary, some outside, you, you'll see during the offertory time. And we invite you to look with your family for those Easter eggs. There's one right there. These eight Easter eggs symbolize the eighth day of creation, the first day of the new creation, Easter morning. And all of the eggs, just so you know, are hidden because today we celebrate the empty tomb, that he is risen, he is risen indeed. So as you watch today, the blended service, take a look for those eight empty Easter eggs. Speed. 
is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of your Son overcame the old order of sin and death to make all things new in him, grant that we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, may reign with him in glory, who lives and reigns in unity with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We invite you to sing our hymn of praise with us, crown him with many crowns.
Psalm 118, 
Now let's let, let us hear the words of the psalmist. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of preparation is number 158 in the hymnals. If you have one, let us together sing, Come Christians, join to sing. Though this is supposed to be a day of rejoicing communally, 
There are many things competing for our attention. We ask a special prayer for all of those who are suffering today from physical ailments or emotional distress. Please wrap us all in your love and comfort and remind us that you are the same God who raised Jesus from the dead. Remind us that you are the God of miracles who will bring life and light from death and chaos. We give you praise for all of our healthcare workers, first responders, and public officials who are helping to keep us and our community safe during this time. Please continue to keep them safe and bless them as they have been such a blessing to others. We also give you thanks and praise for all of the local restaurant staff, grocery store employees, pharmacy workers, trash services, mail carriers, all of those who are working behind the scenes to help us get by in our state of social distancing. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now is the time in our service that we call our offering. There are many ways that you can offer gifts during this time, that you have been offering gifts during this time. You've been offering your prayers. You have been offering by checking on loved ones, by doing special tasks for people, like picking up grocery or medicines. And another way that you can continue to offer things to God during this time is by giving financially to God's church, to this church. It is because of your abundant generosity that we have been able to continue doing these virtual services and the check-ins throughout the week. I also want to let you know that because of your generosity, we were able to help provide over 400 meals to healthcare workers at two hospitals and one clinic here in Mobile. These are hot, boxed lunches that were able to be given because of your generosity. That makes a huge difference. So we thank you for all of the ways you are offering of your time, of your resources, of your prayers during this strange, strange time we are living in. As always, you can make a gift online, you can send a check in the mail, or you can drop something off at the front office. So let us pray together as we consider how we might continue offering ourselves to God and one another. All good gifts come from you, Lord, and from those riches we bring our offering today. Help us to use it to further your purpose in this place and for the benefit of those in need. Amen.
Easter. It's Miss Amy. Um, as most of you know, if you don't, hi, I'm Miss Amy. Um, today we're celebrating, what? Easter, which is a really, really important day for us and a really, really important day for everybody, whether they know it or not. So today, a lot of us woke up and the Easter Bunny had brought us maybe a basket like this. You know, maybe today you got, oh, what is this? Oh, cute little Becky. Or maybe you got some, I don't know, what's this? Fruit snacks. Who wants fruit snacks? I want some candy. I think, I think this egg is empty. It is. Do you know why? Well, if you did your resurrection eggs, which I hope that you did, if you didn't, you can go ahead and do them today. Um, Number 11 was the 11th egg, and it was supposed to be for Easter. Why? Because the tomb was empty. Who can tell me what happened on Friday? Friday, Good Friday. It's kind of funny that it's called Good Friday, but Jesus died. He died on the cross for all of us. And then three days later, he rose. He came back to life, and when they went to find him in the tomb, it was what? It was like this egg, it was empty. But my friends, that is not where the story ends. Like I said, if you did your resurrection eggs, number 12 is the reason it's so important to us today. If you open that egg up, there's a teeny weeny little Bible in there. Now, how cool is that? It's supposed to represent the verse John 3:16 which tells us if God, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that's a really big verse, and sometimes it's kind of hard for us to understand. And so today, I wanna to challenge you with your families to say it a little bit differently. I want you to put yourself into John 3.16, because it helps us to realize just how important that verse is. Try it like this. For God so loved me that he gave me Jesus that 
If I believe in him, I will never perish, but have everlasting life. And that, my friends, is why today is so important. Oh, also, swinging back the other way, in the comments, you'll find a virtual egg hunt. A good friend of mine put that together um, out of Florida and one of the United Methodist churches there. And you can actually go in virtually in their sanctuary and hunt eggs. It's super cool, so you need to try that out. Um, if we can't be in church, uh, then we can be in church somehow, right? All right, so um, I love you all, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful Easter, and I will see you next week. Our gospel passage this morning is taken from the gospel according to John, chapter 20. But before we read that, I would like to share a few words. First, I want to, again, welcome you and thank you for joining us in worship for this Easter morning. Um, all I have to say is, wow, on what's been happening and all the pieces that are coming together. And, whew, we made it. I have spoken with Kristen several times and with my family, and I just wanted to make sure that we could make it to Easter before someone got sick, and we'd have to make some other change, and it would change everything about what we're doing and how we're doing it, and, well, we made it, and that is a wonderful feeling. And now, if we can just make it through May into Pentecost, perhaps we'll all be together again in this wonderful room and be able to appreciate all of these pieces that have been coming together virtually. Um, I wish I could say, I wish you could have heard it live, what, uh, the offer we just heard this morning and all of the singing that's been taking place, but I have had to listen the same way that you have been listening, and that is virtually. And I look forward to um, having all these pieces face-to-face -face and to having you here with us face-to-face -face and be able to celebrate, again, Easter every Sunday morning. As we have made our way through this virtual world and as we're on, I'm on this particular steep uh, learning curve, learning more about um, social media than I ever really wanted to know and, and all the things that, are, that go into making these services um, happen, I just want to give, give a word of thanks and gratitude. Every week, Amy True and Richard True, uh, Jennifer Bemis and Leanne Boykin and Tim Kinsey have, have done... Um, marvelous work in providing and offering their gifts and their skills to make our musical offerings as great as they are. And every week, um, Kristen and I and Jennifer and Amy and Leanne meet on Zoom to plan worship each week. And for we try to plan a week or two out now in this ever-changing world. Now we can't plan as far out as we would like, and we have to always make room for adjustments, which makes life interesting as, we, as I continue to learn how to Zoom. And, and this weekend, on this Easter weekend, we have had an additional um, a second service, the Ascension Sunrise service. Um, I hope you have watched that. If not, I encourage you to go and, 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 and watch this incredible, it's a very different service for us. It's out of the box, and, and it's a powerful service in and of itself. So um, pull that up on the website, our Ashland Place website, or the um, Ashland Place Ascension Facebook page. And of course, we have this service, the uh, blended service, which has been highlighted um, by many people. These Easter services have brought in others um, who have offered their, their gifts and their, their skills. Uh, Elizabeth Bemis, who we just heard offer the offertory, and David Shivers has been helping, and Ellie Boykin has been helping this morning, as well as Micah Wright helped with our Ascension Sunrise service these things are amazing how people and people pieces are coming together. Um, every week, um, we are grateful for what John Miller is doing for us and with us as he's offering his gifts and his skills. Every week, in a normal year, he is with the Ascension Band and um, the past several weeks and hopefully into, into um, as we have to continue to respond virtually to this virus, um, he has been offering his expertise and skills in video production, and so we just give you a great um, word of thank you, um, John, for your work with us. Other things are happening. The church continues to be the church and finds ways to reach out and proclaim the love of God and, and God's presence with us, even in this virtual world. The missions committee with the leadership of Cammie Singleton, the, the Joseph Project with the leadership of of Lee Faircloth and others who have found ways for the church to be the church 
in these rather strange days. As Kristen, Kristen mentioned earlier this morning, it is through the work of these committees and individuals that we are able to provide more than 400 hot meals to healthcare workers who are serving on the front lines in our city. This is a powerful ministry and a powerful message of God's love. These days are certainly different, but the church throughout its history, its long history, has found ways to not only survive, but to thrive in difficult and unfamiliar seasons. So I want to thank all of you who are worshiping with us this morning and throughout this season. And for those who are finding ways to proclaim the Easter message in the world in which we live, I give you thanks. I invite us down to just a moment of prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, of all our days, we come this morning with eager anticipation. We seek to know you, to see you, to touch you. Lord, open our hearts that we may experience you anew. Open our lives that we may be faithful witnesses to your resurrection. May we, with shouts of joy, proclaim your steadfast and liberating love to all people everywhere and at all times. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. As I said, our gospel passage this morning is taken from gospel, the Gospel of John, chapter 20. But before we read that particular passage, that first resurrection experience on the first day of the week, I want us to backtrack a little bit and go all the way back to chapter 1 of John. And be reminded of the prologue that we find where Jesus is proclaimed as the Word made flesh, that the light that will never be overcome by the darkness, and the Word made flesh who comes to live among us. As he enters into that early part of his ministry, he begins to call upon his early disciples. And as he reaches out and calls on them, we find in verse 35 and following in chapter 1, this message. The next day, John, that is John the Baptist again, was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, look, here is the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. I want us to hear this opening um, text as Jesus is calling his disciples there in chapter 1, because this will help inform our reading of chapter 20 as we see this change in how Jesus calls, the resurrected Jesus calls his disciples. Here now reading from chapter 20, verse 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. 
Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending, ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is a powerful episode, a powerful appearance of Jesus Christ following the resurrection. This is the first day of the week. It's often been called by scholars the eighth day of creation as the Easter has turned everything over into new, into something unfamiliar, something unexpected, something unanticipated, a new creation. That's why many baptismal fonts have eight sides. Many churches have eight sides to replicate the understanding of an eighth day of, re of creation. As Kristen noted in our morning introduction video that there are eight eggs scattered around our church this morning it signifying, symbolizing that there are eight days of creation with, res with the resurrection. These eight eggs are empty, symbolizing the empty tomb. As we look for these eggs, as you look for these eggs, as John looked for them earlier this morning, Understand that we have lost something, and in finding the eggs, we have found it. We have lost an understanding, lost something important, someone important, and in finding it, we have great joy. And then finding it empty, we can be confused. But in finding understanding that this is the resurrection, we have joy. John is a wonderful and a powerful gospel. It's often considered a spiritual gospel. It focuses on Jesus Christ as the divine. He was never out of control in the gospel of John. He instigated much, if not all, that happened to him, even to the point of giving up his spirit on the cross. As John lays out this powerful story from the beginning of this prologue where we have the Word made flesh, the light that will never be overcome by darkness, to the calling of those disciples, to the six signs that are offered throughout the Gospel, the signs of God's glory revealed in Jesus Christ, we have this incredible parallel showing the difference, showing the growth, the understanding that's changed by the resurrection. When Jesus in encounters John and his disciples, John calls out, John the Baptist calls out, this is the Lamb of God. 
And two of his disciples followed Jesus, curious about the Lamb of God. What did this John mean? What did this teacher mean about this teacher, this new rabbi, this man we don't know? And so they follow Andrew being one of these disciples of John. Jesus, filling their presence, following him, turns and asks them, what are you looking for? And they answer, Rabbi, where are you staying? And Jesus calls back, come and see. This is the call of a disciple as Jesus was in his earthly ministry. Come and see. Come and see the glory of God. Come and see the signs of God. Come and see the acts of the presence of God that you will find following me. Come and see. In chapter 20, we find the disciples have followed. They have come. They have seen. And when Jesus enters his passion, they have scattered. They have hidden. And on this first day of the new creation, on this first Easter, one of those disciples, Mary Magdalene, shows up sees the stone rolled away and assumes that the tomb must be empty for some reason. Maybe it was grave robbers. Maybe they've moved him. Maybe the authorities have taken Jesus' body. Maybe the Romans have taken Jesus' body. Somebody has done something and Jesus' body is not there. And she runs back to tell someone, someone who would care, someone who might help, Peter and this young disciple whom Jesus loved, Maybe they can do something. Maybe they'll have an answer. Maybe they can help. These two run and they finally make it to the tomb. The one young disciple looks in and sees it was exactly as Mary described it. But he didn't go in and Peter arrives, the elder statesman of the disciples, and he, he arrives, he goes in and finds it just as Mary had described it. It was empty. And we're told he went home. We have no idea what he thought, what he believed. But the other disciple, who follows Peter into the tomb, seeing the linen wrapping, seeing the face cloth rolled up and set aside, believes. It's perplexing because we don't know what he believes. Does he believe in the resurrection or does he believe that Mary Magdalene told the truth, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus' body has been taken? They both leave, these two disciples, and they return home, a place that is familiar, a place that is safe, a place that is not at the tomb, not at this confusion, not at this place of darkness and grief. But Mary stays. Mary Magdalene, she, she lingers behind at the entrance of the tomb. And when she looks in, she sees two angels sitting where Jesus' body had laid, one at the head and one at the feet. The body was no longer there. Only these two messengers for God who offer a word of peace in their questioning. Woman, why are you weeping? My Lord's body has been taken. And I don't know where it is. And I just want to do the right thing. I just want to be able to grieve in peace and, and make my way through this. And I want to be able to honor my Lord's body and prepare it, continue to prepare His body. Just tell me. And Jesus appears to her. And she turns and sees Him. She assumes He's the gardener. She doesn't recognize this very familiar and loved being, this loved teacher, this loved rabbi, her Lord. Taking him for the gardener, she says, just tell me where you've laid him and I will go and I'll take his body back. I'll do what I have to do. And Jesus says to her, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? 
echoing the call of the disciples in chapter 1. What are ye looking for? He tells Mary, whom are you looking for? And he calls her by name. And everything begins to adjust. Everything begins to shift. Everything begins to change. She now recognizes her Lord. She recognizes this familiar man, this familiar face, this familiar voice as her shepherd, the good shepherd. And she cries out, Rabbi, teacher. And then Jesus tells her, do not hold on to me. I have yet to ascend to my Father. And then he goes further. He says, but go and tell my brothers that I am ascending to my Father and their Father, my God and your God. And we're told she goes back to find the disciples, to gather them and tell them that I have seen the Lord. He is risen. He is alive. But this world has changed. This world has completely and utterly changed. It's changed their faith. It's changed their worldview. Everything is beginning to change for the disciples, those who will follow Jesus Christ, who will not only come and see, but will go and tell. Not only those who see Jesus as a teacher, but see Jesus as a brother. Everything. The glory of God is being revealed in their midst. The presence of God is being revealed and changed in unexpected, unanticipated ways. And their faith and their worldviews are being changed. And that's what Easter does for us. It changes our understanding of faith, our understanding of a worldview, how we see the world and how we are called to live in it. Our faith that understands a resurrected Jesus alive and is present with us. It's a worldview that allows us to glimpse God's love and forgiveness in a world filled with uncertainty and change. A faith that declares that what was once hidden is that has been found. A worldview that sees a light that cannot be overcome by darkness. A faith that declares death doesn't have a final word. And a worldview that chooses love over hate, faith over fear, hope over despair, and participation over helplessness. This is a powerful, life-changing, world-transforming faith and worldview. It is Easter, and we are called to be Easter people. As we close this reflection on Easter, I invite us to participate in this following call and response. Today, following each petition, I will... Cue your response with the phrase, Christ is risen, and your response is, of course, Christ is risen indeed. So let us respond. Out of the darkness of grief and despair comes a message of hope. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We run to the tomb to see for ourselves, and it is true. Christ is risen Christ is risen indeed. We hear a voice call our name and we know our risen Lord is with us now and always. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. And now I invite us to affirm our faith together to the Apostles' Creed that is printed in their order of worship. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.